Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Oh, come on, guys. It's New Year's Eve. How are we doing this morning? All right, that's a little bit better. Welcome to Vineyard. My name is Parker Mathias. I'm one of the pastors here. I work largely with youth and young adults, and um, it'd be a shame if I didn't do a small little plug. So if you're in high school or middle school, we do services every single weekend. You should come upstairs. They're awesome. They're great. Aren't they great, guys? Yeah. Um, well, I am so honored to speak to you today because it's New Year's Eve. Guys, it's New Year's Eve. I love speaking at the end of the year because it's a great opportunity to reflect on the past 364 days. And it's been a wild ride, right? 2017 was one for the books. And so many things have happened. Everything from the crazy hurricanes and tropical storms up and down the East Coast and in the Caribbean. New president. Monster movies came out. You know, I'm, I'm a, uh, let me tell you something. I'm a sucker for a good superhero movie. So shout out to Wonder Woman and Thor. Those movies were great. Um, also movies like Get Out. It was, it was just an amazing year for cinema. And then also the rise of social awareness issues. It's just been a crazy year. But moving into 2018, I mean, we can have an array of emotions, right? We can feel excited. We can feel scared. <laughs> we can feel nervous. Or sometimes it's just, eh. We're like, well, it's just another year, right? It's just, it's just another day. But it's also normally this time where we like to place these overcomplicated expectations on our lives in the form of New Year's resolutions. You know, they get pretty crazy sometimes. Like, it was like if I were to stand before you today and say, you know what, guys? At the end of 2018, my goal is to look like Dwayne the Rock Johnson. You'd be like, well, Pastor Parker, I mean... <laughs> That's a lot to do in a year, man. I don't know if you could do that in a year. Or, you know, I'm trying to be as rich as Bill Gates. I'm like, well, he didn't just start out that way. So it, we, we, we just put these complicated things on our lives. And, and change can be difficult, right? Change is always difficult, especially if it doesn't come in the form that we want it to. I live in this house off of Level Green Boulevard near Regent University. And we've coined the house the LGA. And it stands for Level Green Alliance. And it's a great place to live. It actually started as, as a sanctuary for young men within this very church. It started as a place for people who were young. They needed a fresh start. They needed to get out of un unhealthy situations. Or maybe they just needed to learn how to be independent. Man, God bless our landlord. She kept rent low, but the support high. But over the past eight years, at least 15 men from this very church have paid rent in that house. Including one dog who's yet to pull her own weight, but we're still working on that. Don't know how I can do that. Got a couple pictures for you guys. There's some of us. Yeah, You probably know them. They're great. That's from Halloween. Don't judge our costumes, please. <laughs> See, 15 people with varying backgrounds, varying races, varying strengths, weaknesses, challenges, but one common goal, to pursue God more. To pursue God more. We actually have a house verse, and it's 1 Peter 2.17, and it says, Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. The emperor being our landlord at the time. <laughs> Just an intense woman. You see, this mantra, this rallying call, this house verse actually changed my life five years ago when I first moved in. I was a young boy, too smart for my own good, thought I could handle everything on my own. But really, after transferring colleges, changing career paths a couple times, and one reckless driving ticket later, um, I think my parents were ready for that transition. Uh, they loved me. They supported me, though. Um, but for this house, man, this was a place where I could experience the world of rent, bills, responsibilities, budgeting, you know, cooking, which I still haven't conquered yet. It's very difficult. If you're a master chef, I got to get some lessons from you. But I'd be lying if I said that this experience wasn't difficult, if it didn't have its frustrations, if it didn't have its challenges. At the height of the LGA, there were seven guys living in a three-bedroom townhouse. <laughs> seven. Four of us in one room. It was insane. And let's just say I learned pretty quickly that the level of cleanliness at this house was quite different than the way that my parents kept their house. If you know me, I like to clean. When I get stressed, when I get frustrated, I impulse clean. So when my friends see me stand up and start picking up things, they're like, oh no, what's wrong? <laughs> 
And there are moments, I'm gonna be honest, where if a roommate has made a mess, I'll passive aggressively clean. And so I'll start making loud noises, you know, I'm like banging the dishes and I turn the faucet on really loud and I'm, I'm, I'm shaking the trash can as I'm taking it out because my goal is hopefully they'll jump in and join me. <laughs> do your kids do that? Um, yeah, so it doesn't always work out. One time in particular, though, I was impulse cleaning the kitchen and it was time for me to get to the refrigerator. Okay, and with, with multiple guys in there with varying schedules, you'd think we'd cook together, but we're just, we're rarely at the house at the same time. They're so different. So sometimes you get multiple things of milk in the fridge, multiple things of sauces, and, and all of these different things, and people forget which one is theirs, because we've all bought similar things. So like, I don't know if this one's mine. And so sometimes things, what, they expire. <laughs> and so I was going through the fridge, looking at things that were good, that were bad, and I came across this Tupperware. And in this Tupperware was chicken. And I was pretty sure I'd seen this Tupperware in the same, plot, like same location for several weeks, hadn't moved. And so I looked at it, I examined it, and upon further examination, I was pretty sure I saw some mold growing on the chicken. And so I thought, I'm a good roommate. I'm gonna throw the chicken away and clean the Tupperware for my roommate. And I'll put it in the drying rack and, and all that stuff. And so I grab the Tupperware and I walk over to the trash can and I lift off the lid and I shake it over the trash can, but nothing falls out. And so I shake it again and I've realized that the chicken has fused with the Tupperware. <laughs> <laughs> and before I had time to turn it around and, and look at it, man, I was hit in the face. I was hit in the face so hard I almost fell down to the ground. When I say that this thing stunk, that is an understatement, okay? My body immediately went into a fight or flight situation and my hand dropped that Tupperware and I like whooshed back about five feet trying to keep myself from throwing up. Let's just say that Tupperware was never seen again. <laughs> and though moments like this can be funny, they're often frustrating. And, and, and it was, uh, you know, a time where guys were getting older, guys were moving out, they were getting married, life circumstances were different, new people were coming in, and it felt like things were different. It felt like the times had changed, like the house was different. And it made me doubt my living situation. Was it worth it to be here and deal with all of this? For some reason, I thought that because the people were different, that the mission God placed on the house was also different. That because the times had changed, Man, the purpose was lost. The promise was no longer there. And we do this in our lives sometimes, don't we? When things don't go as planned, we immediately assume it must not be destined. It's not, in, it's not in the books for me. See, but the truth is, it's the things that we have to fight for that are sometimes worth the most. You see, some of us can't even think about 2018 because we're too focused on what didn't happen in 2017. We're too focused on that promotion that didn't come in our job or, or that, that breakthrough that didn't come into our marriage or that pound that was never lost on the scale. We get so wrapped up in these things and, and, and these mindsets keep us from moving forward. See, there's a way to make your goals seem less intimidating though. There's a mindset that allows us to understand that promises do not expire and that God desires nothing but to see us succeed in life. I wanna share some things with you today and I've, I've got a tweetable thought. And it's going to make sense in a little bit, but you can tweet it, you can post it on Facebook, you can text it to a friend who maybe needs it in this time. But that thought is this, it's already yours. It's already yours. And that'll make sense in a little bit, I, I promise, but I, I, I want you to know that it's important that when something is spoken over your life from God, it is already yours. So you have a new appreciation for the Old Testament. See, when, when we assume, when we hear old, what do we think? Unimportant, not relevant, needs to be replaced, old batteries, old car, old house, old kitchen, old sink, things that need to be replaced. But the truth is, is the Old Testament tells us why and how we needed to get to Jesus. It's the backstory to the main story. It's the prequel to the original. We're talking about a very specific promise that was spoken thousands of years ago to a very specific person. This was after the creation of the universe, after Adam and Eve, after the flood, we get this man named Abram, whom we more famously know as Abraham. But before he was Father Abraham, he was just another old guy with an old wife who couldn't have children. And then God had the nerve 
to speak this promise over his life. This is what he says in Genesis 12. He says, the Lord has said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. And that sounds really good. But I feel like this concept would have been foreign to Abraham. Here God is speaking this promise over him that he's going to be a great nation, but he has no children. He's going to be, he's going to have this promised land, but he has no army to take it. Nations were supposed to kill nations. They weren't supposed to be blessings. And so it's foreign. And if you know anything about this story, you know it was a hard thing to accomplish. It's pretty crazy. Like somebody should call Guiding Light because this is a soap opera waiting to happen. See, Abraham finally has a son with his wife. But before that, he had a son with his wife's servant. (laughs) But then he he takes Isaac, and Isaac has uh, two, two sons as well, Jacob and Esau. But then Jacob, the younger brother, lies and seals his inheritance from his older brother. And then Jacob goes on to have 12 sons, one of which named Joseph, who is his favorite. And his other brothers get jealous, and so they sell Joseph off into slavery, and they tell his father that he's dead. I was waiting for the evil twin to pop up somewhere, you know. <laughs> but no, Joseph goes, he ends up in Egypt and he survives slavery. He survives prison. He gets close to the Pharaoh and ends up becoming the governor of Egypt. He ends up saving that land from starvation because there was a famine. And his, his, his family ends up coming to Egypt to get food and they're reunited. And then Joseph is so connected to the Pharaoh that they allow his family to live in Egypt and they grow and they multiply But enter another problem. The Pharaoh dies and another one rises who doesn't know Joseph, doesn't know what he did. And so he imprisons all the Israelites, all the Jews, all of Abraham's descendants for 400 years. And then finally, God sends Moses to free the the Israelites from captivity in Egypt. And of course, after 10 plagues, they finally escape and they get all the way to the Red Sea only to turn around and see the Egyptians coming right back for them. But of course, God, what? He parts the Red Sea. They walk through the Red Sea on dry ground. They're free. The Egyptians try to follow them, and the waves come crashing back down. And then they wander around in the wilderness for a little bit. You know, they they keep being disobedient, and, and they're delaying their time. But eventually, finally, they get to the Jordan River. And on the other side of the Jordan River, man, that's the promised land. That's it. It's the thing that God spoke almost 500 years before to Abraham course he's dead by now and so God raises up this new leader named Joshua this mighty warrior and God parts the Jordan River and they walk through on on solid ground on dry ground and they get across the Jordan River River and battle after battle success after success they take land after land pushing the other nations out of the land that God promised them and so they're finally in this promised land and it was customary for when a nation they took over land they would divide it amongst the people And so within the Israelites, they had tribes, almost like like your immediate family would be a tribe. And so the tribes, they came before Joshua and they said, hey, what land is ours? I want to know what part of this land is mine. What part of this land can I settle in? And this is how Joshua responds in Joshua 18. It says, the whole assembly of the Israelites gathered at Shiloh and they set up the tent of meeting there. The country was brought under their control. But there were still seven Israelite tribes who had not yet received their inheritance. So Joshua said to the Israelites, How long will you wait before you begin to take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has given you? How long will you wait to take possession of the land that you already have? How long will you wait to realize that the very ground that you stand on is that promised land? You're here. See, too often in life do we realize that the very thing we want is already in our ownership. The qualifications, the requirements, they've already been fulfilled. It's already within our grasp. See, Joshua isn't talking about ownership here. You know, many of us own things, right? Clothes that we don't wear, food that goes expired, parts of the house that we go unclean because nobody can see them. See, owning something doesn't necessarily mean you have possession of it. It's one thing to recognize ownership, but another thing to possess it. You have to use it like it's yours. Today I'm going to talk about three things that I believe we already have. 
But if we take possession of those three things, I promise you, you will see positive change in your life. You will see God do something amazing. My first and, and one of the most important is this, point number one on your outline, salvation is already yours. Salvation is already yours. I originally was going to put forgiveness in the blank, but I couldn't do that. <laughs> I feel like too often we limit what God did for us based on the one word forgiveness. Now that's true, God forgives us, absolutely. But that's not all he came to do. See, that's not why Jesus came down from heaven and he died. Forgiveness is great, but at the end of the day, forgiveness doesn't cut it. Let, let, let me give you an example. Let's say you're in massive debt. Okay, you've, you've borrowed way too much money. You can't pay it back. There's no way you're going to pay it back. And I, being the lender, come before you and say, I forgive you. Don't worry about paying me back. It's gone. It's water under the bridge. That's probably really freeing, right? You get freed from this burden of debt. You no longer have to pay me back. But the problem with just forgiving you is that you can go back out and get another credit card. You can go back and take out another mortgage on the house. You can buy another car that's too expensive and you can't afford we can find ourselves right back in debt. That's forgiveness. See, Jesus came not merely to forgive us, but to bring salvation, to save us from our sin and our mistakes, not just so that we couldn't feel ashamed anymore, but that we would no longer be bound by that sin. Romans 6.14 says this, sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under that old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. There's another translation that says, sin is no longer your master. It no longer gets to tell you how to live your life. You have been saved from sin, not just forgiven of it. The old tyranny Paul talks about in this verse is the law of Moses. Because in the Old Testament, in order to be forgiven, you had to make special sacrifices or, or practices. But they were just forgiven. It meant their sin was only temporarily hidden until they fell back into those same behaviors and they had to make another sacrifice another practice. See, the promised land was always accessible to the Israelites, but it was their complicated history that prolonged the possession of it. See, sometimes it's the shortcuts in our lives that actually lead us to dead ends. Salvation is already yours. We do not live under this old tyranny any longer. This system that was made up of laws was meant to point out sin, but it didn't bring a solution to it. The solution came in the form of Jesus, the Son of God who tells us that in the face of adversity, we get to look at it and say, sin, you have no power over my life. You have no control of me. You do not own me. I am not defined by you because salvation is already mine. See, we live in the consequences of our actions, and that's so true. But the cool thing about salvation is actions no longer have a place in our lives that are sinful. You can get rid of them. You can run from them. You can flee from them. They no longer have to be a part of what we're doing. But also, too many of us, man, we wait for perfection before salvation. We wait until we're good before we come before the Lord. We say, well, I've got to get my life in order before I can walk into that building, until I can really start following God. But Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. You don't go and pay that copay if you're perfectly healthy. You're especially not going to a specialist and paying that expensive copay if you're healthy. God said, I've come to reach the sick. Stop waiting for perfection because perfection is already in your grasp through Jesus. Take possession of your salvation today. And what's crazy is sometimes accepting that you are saved can be the hardest part because this next step is a little more difficult. Point number one was salvation is already yours. Point number two is this, victory is already yours. Victory is already yours. It's hard to have this mindset. It's hard to know that if God spoke it, he will fulfill it. Can you imagine what the Israelites thought throughout this whole process? This amazing promise spoken to Abraham 500 years, and now it's partially fulfilled. You know the part where they said, I'd, I'd give you land. They're still not a great nation. They're still not a blessing to other people. But God didn't leave them the entire time, and he never leaves them. See, so you got to ask yourself, what thing in your life hasn't happened yet, and you've given hope up hope on it? What is that thing in your life that you're waiting to happen? Maybe it's financially related. Maybe it's, it's you know, uh, relational or, or even children. What breakthrough are, were you hoping for, praying for, and it never came through? See, if you truly believe that that promise was from God and it's aligned with this will, victory is already yours. And I don't mean that the problem is already solved. 
I mean that the moment that promise came out of the mouth of God, the completion was already constructed. I feel like some of y'all didn't hear that, man. The moment you receive a promise from God, the completion of it is already constructed. You see, the house that I live in, it hasn't just touched 15 lives. 15 people have paid rent, but so many more have come through the doors. The couch has been used countless times for guys who needed a place to stay the night, a week, sometimes longer. (laughs) In the past eight years, I'd say hundreds of people have come through the doors of that house looking for a sanctuary, looking for community, or just for a place to pass the time. Just this past week, I was, as of a picture, I was able to bring some of the youth over and celebrate all of our wins this year for a Christmas party. (laughs) You see, but when you just pay rent somewhere, it's not quite the same, right? I mean, you appreciate the space for sure. You want it to look nice when people come in, but at the end of the day, you know if something big breaks, that's not on you. (laughs) The AC goes out, landlord, the roof's leaking, hey, (laughs) you don't have to fix those things. But about a year ago, my landlord approached me with the the thought of purchasing the house. I was at dinner at her house with her family, and when she said that, I told her, you're insane. (laughs) I'm way too young for this. I'm broke. It's not going to happen. But she said, no, no, I really think you need to think about this. And so I took some time to pray about it. I, I talked to my family. I talked to my friends. And, and this past June, I was like, I think God wants me to do this. I think God wants me to continue the mission of the house, for it to be a safe place for young guys looking to pursue God. You see, that promise that never, the, the promise of the house never actually left, but, but I realized that God needed to give me a new outlook on that promise. So I went to apply for a loan in June, and I was very quickly denied. <laughs> Apparently, my student loan debt versus my income wasn't a good compare. Like, they didn't go get well together. Basically, he told me, you don't make enough money. And I was like, yes. <laughs> and so I texted my landlord. I said, hey, I don't think it's going to happen. And every time I, I'd encounter a roadblock, she said, but have you thought about this option? Did you think, this, did you think about do, going about it this way? And after about six months of, of saving and organizing and debt reducing, just two weeks ago, almost three weeks ago now, I own the house. <laughs> What's crazy is that signing those 500 sheets of paper and giving that heartbreaking check over to the mortgage company, man, every time I walk into the house, I view it differently. You better believe every crumb on that house I've seen, every knack on the wall I've noticed, every person that comes in all, you know, just shoving their stuff all around, I'm like, what are you doing? (laughs) My perception of the house has completely changed. Now that I have possession of the house, I see it in a different light. I also see that the past five years have been preparation for this very moment, that God knew this mission needed to continue and he was prepping me for it. You know, I didn't think it was going to happen. It was long. It was frustrating. I thought I had to drag a cosigner down with me. (laughs) You see, but every time I saw a dead end in this process, my landlord saw that I was going in the wrong direction. John 16, 33 says this, I've told you all this so that trusting me, you will be unshakable and assured deeply at peace. In this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties, but take heart. I've conquered the world. God says, I've told you this promise and you can be sure it will come to completion. So in your assurance, be unshakable, be at peace. Know that even in the face of difficulties, I've already overcome the world, so victory is already yours. You can operate in a level of confidence that is beyond yourself. See, maybe your biggest, pro- your pro- biggest problem isn't the promise itself, but it's the way you perceive the promise. Maybe it's time to change your outlook. The Israelites didn't expect to wait that long to receive the promised land but it was always going to happen. It wasn't until they took possession of that land that the nation started to grow, that they started to become great. See, when you see a dead end, ask yourself, am I going in the right direction? Am I headed in the way that God has for me? See, we live in a very different time than Joshua and the Israelites. When Joshua said, take possession of the land, it kind of means something different to us today. In the Old Testament, It was all about personal sacrifices, but in the New Testament, it was about the sacrifice that was already made for us. And in fact, um, we forget that a big part of the why things are already ours and why it's important to take possession, it's because of who gave it to us. Taking possession doesn't mean disregarding God's involvement. In fact, it means the opposite. 
We're able to take possession because of who God is. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. You've probably heard this verse before, but it sounded like this. God's not going to give you anything you can't handle. And that sounds really good, but that's only a portion of the verse. And it's true, but this phrase, it misses a big reason of why we can handle all things. God will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear because he said that he also will provide the way out. And that way out will allow us to endure it. It's not a pass off, guys. It's a partnership with God. He doesn't say, here's the things, handle it. He says, no, here's the things, I'm going to get you through it. Point number one was salvation is already yours. Point number two, victory is already yours. And my last point today, point number three is this, Jesus is already yours. Jesus is already yours. Maybe we don't successfully get through something because we're so focused on the, we're, we're, we're missing the one who actually made the way for us. We're so focused on the promise, we miss the promise provider. Temptations can't, can they, they can either take us down or they can be the very thing that allows us to stand a little bit taller. You see, overcoming temptation and hardship, we produce endurance and perseverance. Salvation is already yours, so sin has no control over your life. Victory is already yours, so you can be confident in your pursuit. But these things are able to happen because Jesus is already ours. See, God saw that this system built among the Israelites, especially in getting them to the promised land, he knew that it wasn't enough. That making sacrifices wasn't enough. And you may even be thinking, well, why did they have to make sacrifices in the, for the first place, you know? Surely God didn't want to eat lamb every night for dinner. No, that's true. But the sacrifices were an attempt to get people to understand that actions have consequences. And they don't just affect us, they affect other people. You see, when they made a, a sacrifice, it wasn't always convenient. It wasn't the, the animal that was you know, least liked, the animal that wasn't producing the most. It was a healthy option. It was the best, actually. It's kind of like this. If it, it, maybe you know a family where they, they ask their children to give up a toy around this time of year for someone in need. If you ask them to give up a toy that they don't play with, you're just getting rid of, you're, you're getting rid of something that's occupying space. It means nothing to them. But if you lay out three or four of their favorite toys and say, one of these we're going to give to someone in need, the meaning changes. The sacrifice is different. You begin to recognize that God has blessed us and that sin undermines those blessings. When we sin, where we're saying, I don't want the blessings, I don't deserve the blessings. See, the Israelites do end up becoming this great nation. We know King David, he was this mighty warrior, and they told stories of his victories all over the world. And then, of course, they tell stories of his relationship with Bathsheba and how he messed up in that way. And then we get King Solomon, the wise builder king, People coming from all over the place to Israel to hear his wisdom and to see the things that he had constructed. But then he messes up. The Israel nation begins to fall apart. It divides in two. And actually, the, it, it's noticed. People realize this. They say, this is our opportunity. And Syria invades both the northern and the southern kingdom of Israel, and they take control of it. And then fast forward some years later, we get the rise of the Roman Empire. Alexander the Great. Pompey the Great. Not the volcano. There's a person and they actually take control of that entire area, united, bring peace. They take control of Israel. They establish these crazy travel networks and trade networks on roads and ports so you can get everywhere, like almost everywhere, easily than you could before. See, the Jews had lost hope of ever seeing this promise fulfilled. But just when they least expected it, when they still operated under this system of sacrifices, when they were still separated from God, forgiveness versus salvation, in order to break this separation and do something personal, God realized he had to do something relational. That he had to come down to this earth personally, enter Jesus, the Son of God, who lives this perfect life, and during this life, man, he connects with so many people, outcasts, sinners, those who are forgotten, the Pharisees, everybody and anybody, he says that they're valuable. See, God's goal was to close the divide between man and God, to allow direct access, access between us and him for a relationship. See, at the climax of Jesus' ministry, he dies. And no one expected the Messiah to die. They expected this mighty warrior to come and free them from the Roman captivity. You see, but he had to die because the wages of sin is death. 
Sin kills things. Sin kills marriages. Sin kills relationships. It kills our bank accounts. It kills our businesses, our friendships. It sneaks its way in. It brings distractions and it brings compromise. Sin leads things to disappear or to die. In order for the power of sin in our lives to die, someone had to die. And God decided it wasn't going to be us. It was going to be him. The only difference between us and him is that sin wasn't strong enough to keep him down. In Romans 8, verse 37 through 39, it says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present or the future, neither any powers or, nor height or nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus came back to life three days later. He defeated death, defeated sin, defeating separation from God so that our salvation would be ours, so that our victory would be ours. Not just for me, not just for the person next to you, but for you, for your family, for your friends. Jesus died so that everything in God and in heaven would be yours. He presented this gift to us. It's ours. It's free. But we can't merely own something. We have to take possession of it. See, take possession of the sacrifice that Jesus made so that in the face of trials, we can say salvation is mine, so sin you have no control over my life. In the face of defeat, we can say victory is already mine, so I know this is merely an obstacle that I'm going to get over. When we feel hopeless and lonely, we can say Jesus is already mine. I am a child of God. I am no longer separated from my Father in heaven. You have that opportunity right now to take possession of what God has placed before you. You don't have to wait. You don't have to wait until tomorrow or the next day or the next day or when, when things in your life are perfect and you've solved that one problem that's been keeping you from going forward. Right now, the gift has been given to you. And I want to give you that opportunity to receive it, to take possession of it, to move forward. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for who you are, Lord. That you've given us so much that we've received so much from you, Lord. That we are never lost. God, we are never forgotten. God, I speak over the promises that have been placed in our life right now, Lord. Those things that, that have been rooted into our heart from you. Goals of, of success or of, of reaching people, Lord, or, or of changing, of breakthrough, Father. We declare in Jesus' name right now, God, that salvation is already ours. God, that the victory in that breakthrough is already ours. God, that we don't have to look back on 2017 and be fearful for the year to come, Lord. We can look forward and be excited for the promise that is yet to be fulfilled, but we know and we stand assured that it will be. God, I speak to doubt that where there's doubt, Lord, we would approach you more. It wouldn't be something that al would allow us to, to move further away from you, Father, but it would allow us to move closer to you, to bring questions to you, God, to bring our, our, our assurance to you, Lord. And if while I was speaking, if you, if you felt like God wanted you to take possession of who he was, you've never done that before, you've thought about it, or maybe it's been a really long time since you have and you want to you know, take ownership of it again, I want to give you that opportunity right now. You can take possession of it. You can take hold of it right now. So I encourage you to pray this prayer with me. You can, you can say it at your seats or you can say it in your heart. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I know I stray away, Lord. I know I've messed up, God. I know that sin finds its way into my life, Lord, but I no longer want to be bound by that. God, I accept the salvation in you. Lord, I accept the victory in you. God, and I accept you as my Savior, Jesus. Change me, Lord. Make me new. Today I trust you, and today I follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I feel like we just need to lift up a shout of praise. I don't know why. Can we just be excited for a second? Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com give. 
Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.